really great you've um, tuned in today. Uh, yeah, so I'm the deputy head of the Monash Medicine course. Um, I've been teaching Monash medical students for about 20 years, and I'm also a Monash Medicine graduate myself. So I'm very happy um, to be talking to you about the course today. Before I get started, I'll do, I'll do an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I'm on today. So that's um, Monash Uni Clayton. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present. A bit about today's session. Uh, so between Shui and I, we're going to cover a number of topics. So a bit of a brief course overview. Um, we'll talk about the clinical placements um, that are available to Monash medical students a bit about the um, two main study pathways, um, direct entry and graduate entry, um, about entry requirements and selection criteria, um, some of the different entry schemes, and then um, you'll get the real info from our students. So big thank you to Connor, Chow Wen, Jen and Caitlin. Uh, so first of all, there's two main ways to get into medicine at Monash. Um, the first is uh, direct entry, which is straight from school. And every year we have about 330 um, medical students who start straight from school. Uh, and then there's the MD graduate pathway. Uh, and this is a four year program, unlike the direct entry, which is five years. And this is for students who have already done a degree at university. So mostly we'll be focusing on the direct entry pathway for today. Um, a bit about the course. So this is kind of a bird's eye view of the course. I'll, I'll orientate you to the, um, to the diagram. Um, so first of all, we have four themes that run through the course. Um, so one's about um, professionalism, uh, medico-legal stuff, um, medical ethics. The next one is um, about health and illness. Theme two is about health and illness at um, a societal level or population level. Um, theme three is all about how the body works and what can go wrong. And theme four is about clinical practice. So um, things like assessing patients, taking a history, doing a physical examination, um, and then trying to work out what's wrong with the patient. Um, and then making decisions about how you can help them or the treatment. Um, if we look across here, we've got the year levels. So year one and two. So these take place on campus. Um, and then the, the clinical years, the last three years of the course, um, occur in the hospital setting. So they're in the health healthcare services. Um, so a bit about the on-campus learning. So that's the first two years. Um, so traditionally, university education, a lot of it was um, sitting in traditional lecture theatres, uh, but that's all changed now. Now um, at Monash, we have a lot of these big flat floor teaching spaces. Uh, so this is a bird's eye view of a flat floor teaching space um, where we might have up to 150 students in a room, but they they all sit in small groups and. Um, discuss patient cases, um, explain things to each other um, and try and solve problems together. Uh, so that's part of it. There's um, hands-on tutorials. So here we've got some students learning, uh, practicing how to examine a patient. Um, and then we do, ha we have a mix of in-person and online education resources. And since COVID, we've been um, working really hard to try and find the best balance of, of in-person and online. Um, got some other examples of students learning here. So this student will be looking um, under a, at a, uh, looking at some cells or some tissue under a microscope. Could be normal tissue or it could be tissue um, with disease. And here's a student doing some anatomy study, so looking at the muscles of the lower limb. Um, and just to pick on one of the one of the um, preclinical subjects, anatomy. 
Um, we've got a beautiful new anatomy facility here. Actually, the, the facilities at um, Monash are lovely. There's lovely gardens, um, lots of modern buildings and modern teaching spaces. So come and have a look. Um, and anatomy forms a big part of the, the preclinical program. But there's other subjects like physiology, pharmacology, uh, pathology, uh, microbiology, um, all the ologies. Um, a bit about the latter three years of the course. So these three years take place in the hospitals. Um, we have quite a number of partner hospitals um, who are also very interested in training um, uh, soon to be doctors and other um, people training in health professions. Um, and all these sites have um, a Monash Uni hub within the, within the hospital. Um, so we have links with Mildura Hospital, uh, Bendigo, um, Bairnsdale, Sale, uh, Warrigal, Trelvin, Leangatha, Wonthaggy. So they're our rural sites. Um, but we also have um, a lot of metropolitan sites. So just to name some of them, the Alfred Hospital, Sandringham Hospital, Monash Medical Centre, Dandenong Hospital, Casey Hospital, Fox Hill Hospital, uh, Maroondah Hospital, the Anglis and, and more. Um, learning in the hospitals, so there's still education facilities, there's still tutorials. Um, so these students are learning about um, equipment used in the treatment of asthma. And these students are learning how to stitch up a, a wound. Um, sometimes students practice on plastic patients so some of the things medical students learn um, uh, are, are like life-saving skills, and it's very important um, to get them right. Uh, so they don't start off practicing on um, real patients. We start off with practice patients and, and get the skills up first. Uh, sometimes students practice on each other. Uh, here's a student, so he looks like a fourth year, probably doing his um, pediatrics. And he's about to examine this newborn baby. Uh, this student looks like she's doing her general practice term. Um, and she's probably going to interview this patient. Uh, here's um, another student. She's probably a third year student uh, practicing how to um, elicit reflexes. And these two are students here. Uh, looks like they're in a community setting. And this is the patient, the baby. Um, a lot of the learning in the hospital, a lot of the teaching in the hospital is done by uh, staff, clinicians who work in the hospital, mostly doctors, um, but also other um, healthcare professionals such as nurses, physios, pharmacists um, get involved in the education of our students. All our students get to spend time in the operating theatre, um, often watching, but sometimes helping. Uh, some of the learning um, occurs with students from other um, disciplines. So this is a tute group about prescribing medication and there's medical students, nursing students and pharmacy students. Um, so being a doctor, it's really a team activity. Um, so that, that starts at the student level too. Um, in medicine, a, a lot of the learning comes from the professors and the senior doctors, um, but there's also um, a very big tradition of learning from um, the other students or doctors who are just a few years ahead of you. Uh, and that starts in medical school. And this is just a picture of a couple of first year doctors uh, so they're Monash graduates and they've come back to um, host the last week of lectures for the students who are graduating. Um, and you can see lots of smiles there and that's because it's their last, probably their last 10 minutes of university. Um, so a little overview. So the preclinical is all, all about the, the basic sciences and getting ready. So getting the skills that you need to start learning in the hospital setting. And then there's the three years in the hospital setting. Uh, the first year in the hospital setting is a big transition year. There's a lot to get used to. 
and the last year is really all about getting ready for work and it's a bit of a, a practice year for work. Um, the students join in the, the clinical teams and um, really help them get involved in patient care and, and have um, increasing responsibility. And the student's confidence grows um, across the course. And I can tell you that last year, 96% um, of our students either felt prepared or very prepared for um, work as a doctor. And that was compared to a national average of about 75%. So um, we, we got a pretty good rating there on the, on the national survey. Um, there's many, many extracurricular activities. I can't keep up with all the different clubs and groups that the med students organize. I've just put a picture up of one of them. Um, this is the Monash Medical Orchestra. Uh, so for any of you who play an instrument, might be of interest. I think this is about my last slide. Um, I just thought I'd make a list of some of the things that I think make for um, a good medical student. Um, what sort of person might be suited to study medicine? Um, and I looked at the list and I thought, well, these are really things that are good for any of the health disciplines. So um, medicine, nursing, physio, uh, radiotherapy. Um, really, it's an interest in um, working with people, an interest in being of service to others, um, and also um, being interested in science um, and technology um, as well. But there's many different areas in medicine and some are more technical than others. I think being an energetic person is important. It's hard work, okay? Um, uh, the learning is often practical. So you need to be a person who's prepared to give things a go and, and learn by doing. There's a lot of study involved. Um, and it doesn't just stop at the end of medical school, it continues on. Uh, so it's good if you enjoy learning and don't mind study. Um, communication is um, a very big part of it. Uh, not just being a good talker, but also being a good listener. Um, there's a lot of problems to solve. So enjoying challenges and problem solving is good. And then also a willingness to take on responsibility and be a leader. And I understand that you're in high school at the moment, and um, uh, it might be hard for you to imagine yourself as a doctor one day. Um, but really, if you, if you think about these things and maybe compare yourself to um, most of your friends, and um, if you think you, you know, you've got uh, some of these, um, then maybe considering medicine is good for you. Thanks, Julia. The more day. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right, I'm just gonna have a moment while I share my screen. You can stop sharing your screen now. Yeah. All right, um, can everyone see my screen? Julia, can you please come forward if you can see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, um, hi everyone, I'm back again. Um, so right now I'll run through very briefly the admissions process as well as the various selection criteria that we look at if you are considering medicine for 2024 entry. Okay, so in a nutshell, there are essentially two pathways to get into medicine at Monash. So there is the direct entry pathway, which is the five-year program, or the graduate entry pathway, which is the four-year program. So if you are considering medicine, but you aren't too sure if you want to do it straight out of high school yet, you could always do it as a postgrad option, whereby you could choose to do biomed with us first, or science, physio, or even pharmacy, which will take three to four years. And essentially, it becomes a three plus four year program. So both pathways pretty much lead to the same outcome, whereby you do a one year of internship upon graduation. So direct entry will be five years, while postgrad entry will be a three plus four year program. And if you're looking at the number of places, year on year for direct entry, we take in about 230 places um, for domestic students and about 70 places are allocated for international students. So just a reminder that today's presentation would be more tailored towards domestic entry um, in regards to getting into medicine. But if there are any international students in the audience today that have questions, um, feel free to pop them via the Q&A uh, function and we will have staff answer them as well. All right, so 
in regards to getting into medicine, uh, we do look at three main um, items. So that's um, your ATAR, obviously, um, as well as the UCAT and the MMI. So in regards to the prereq subjects that you need, um, you only need English and chemistry. Biology is not compulsory, but it is highly recommended. You can choose to do bio um, once you get an offer from us. So you will be provided with um, an online um, subject that you could do uh, before you commence medicine with us. And there's the UCAT component as well, which I'll talk more about it in a bit. And the MMI, which is the multi-minute interview that you will be requested to do should you be shortlisted for the, the program. So we, I did see a couple of questions in regards to what was the lowest ATAR um, to which an offer was made in 2023. So these scores are actually on our website. It's on our study page for medicine under entry requirements. And you could see that it ranges um, depending on which pathway you choose. So bear in mind that these um, ATARs are um, based on you know, um, whereby our students were ranked for selection on the basis of three equally weighted components, the UCAT, ATAR, and interview. So do not take this um, score by itself. That's just because there are other components involved as well. So take note that the lowest ATAR displayed there um, is the lowest ATAR before Cs and any Dean's rural list adjustment was made. Again, all this is on our website, on our study page. In regards to subjects, um, the one I mentioned, you need English and chemistry. So if you are currently doing VCE, you would need at least 35 in English EAL or 30 in English other than EAL, and at least 30 in chemistry. So if you're doing IB, you would need at least five in English standard level or four in English higher level or six in English standard English B standard level, or five in English B higher level, as well as at least five, a score of five in chemistry standard level, or four in chemistry higher level. Like what I've mentioned, biology is highly recommended, but not mandatory. All right, so here's for the information about the UCAT. Um, so UCAT's the test that you do in the year that you apply for medicine. So if you're looking to commence medicine in 2024, next year, you have to do your UCAT this year. So registrations for UCAT has already opened. So if you have not registered for it, you better start looking into it because you need to do the UCAT and to receive a score in order for us to assess you for entry for 2024 um, to begin in 2024. So selection for December interviews will be based solely on UCAT results. And selection for January interviews will be based on a combination of UCAT and ATAR results. So for 2024 entry, the indicative UCAT score we're looking at is 2,900 in order to be considered for an interview. So bear in mind that this 2,900 does not guarantee you an interview it pretty much um, sets a baseline to you know, encourage students, um, to provide students with an idea of what score they can you know, sort of work towards in order to be considered for an interview. So the UCAT score may change from year to year depending on the distribution of scores as well as the number of applicants applying to Monash each year. Again, this is all on our website. A lot more details actually on our website. A bit more info on the UCAT. So you can only sit the test in the same year you apply. So like what I mentioned, if you're starting in 2024, you do the test this year in 2023. You can only sit the test once each year. It's a two hour multiple choice test um, aimed at assessing a range of different uh, mental abilities. There are lots of practice tests and resources on the UCAT website, so do make sure to fully utilize that. A bit more information about the MMI. So moving forward, all MMIs will be conducted online. So as one of, like what I've mentioned, um, MMIs will be conducted in December if you are shortlisted based on UCAT. If not, it'll be in January. 
So for the MMIs, there will be six sequential interview stations. There'll be one interview per interviewer per station. So once you've finished um, your segment on the first station, you will pretty much move towards station two, three, four, five, six. So each station is independent by its own. Your responses in station one will not impact your following responses in the subsequent stations. So the whole circuit could take up about 70 to 80 minutes to complete. So only applicants who attend the interview will remain eligible to be offered a place in the MD program. So this is pretty much just to recap um, what I've mentioned earlier. All applicants will be invited via email to participate in the MMI. So this email um, will be sent sometime in December if you are shortlisted for a December round interview. So if you're not shortlisted for a December round interview, um, we will look at your UCAT and aggregate ATA score for a January round interview. So only, like what I've mentioned, only those applicants who attend an interview will remain in the final selection pool um, to be eligible for a place. All applicants applying for this course are only allowed to attend the interview once. So if you are looking at reapplying the following year, but you have already done the interview, you will not be required to do the interview again. So a little um, bit of what to expect as part of um, your interview. I've pretty much already mentioned it earlier, but these are some um, tips that our students have shared with us. Um, there are five to six questions that will be asked based on a certain scenario. And there is no right or wrong answer in regards to um, the types of questions that are asked. So each applicant will have a different response, obviously. So it is really, you know, um, encouraged that students practice, uh, practice it with their friends or family members prior to actually attending the interviews. So there's no expectation of clinical knowledge um, for the questions that are asked during the interview, but most of them would have been developed around a medical or healthcare team. These are the key dates that you should pay attention to if you're looking at 2024 entry. So the timings are usually quite similar year on year. They may differ by a week or two, but if you're looking at 2024 entry, do take note of these dates. Further information is on our website and it should be updated with 2024 dates soon. Sorry. So just a reminder to register for your UCAT if you have not um, for this year. So this is just a brief overview of the domestic applicant poll, just to provide you with um, a realistic um, <laughs> overview of how many students actually apply to our degree every year. So approximately 3,500 students would have done the UCAT test and out of the 3,500 students, about 75% uh, would meet the required score and actually complete the prereq subjects required. And ultimately, about 35% of um, that figure would actually be offered a place. So that's about 237 places, 237 domestic places. So we do have a couple of different um, schemes um, that you would have heard as well in regards to the types of places available in our MED program. So one of them is the extended rural cohort. So it is a separate VTAC code that you need to put through when you are placing your preferences on VTAC. So every year we've got about 30 Commonwealth supported places available in the ERC. So just a reminder that you are not required to be a rural student in order to be eligible for the ERC. So what makes this pathway different from the others uh, is that the first two years, um, you will pretty much spend it at Clayton. But for the rest of the degree, which is the following three years, you will be spending most of your clinical training years in rural and regional Victoria. So just a reminder that if you are, if you are interested in doing your placements 
broadly, um, you would need to apply via a separate VTAC code. We also have bonded medical places. So the federal, it's a federal government requirement that about 28.5 places are set aside as bonded places. So what this means is that upon graduation, you may be required to work in a district of workforce shortage for a period of three years. Again, um, this path, this um, place is actually, um, you we need to apply for it using a separate VTAC code. So there are essentially three different VTAC codes that you need to pay attention to if you're looking to study medicine at Monash. So we do have a couple of different schemes um, for different groups of students. So if you identify yourself as um, someone who has a rural background, um, we do have the Dean's Rural List. So the Dean's Rural List is open to students who are considering medicine or even biomedical science. So if you have resided um, based on your principal home address for at least five years consecutively or 10 years cumulatively, in certain areas, um, you could be eligible for the Dean's Rural List. So have a look at our website. Um, that's just because if you are eligible for the DRL, it could actually boost your chances in getting an interview for medicine. So once VTech applications have closed, um, all eligible applicants will be sent an email sometime in October requesting for further information. So be sure to check your spam mail. That's just because sometimes um, Monash, Monash's email may end up in your spam mail. So keep an eye on that. That's just because if you miss that email, um, you will miss, um, you will potentially miss opportunities of being eligible as a Dean's Rural List student. So further information is on our website. So have a look at um, the health workforce locator, put in just your postal code and it will come up with the right um, categories and information in regards to your eligibility. We also have the Monash Indigenous Entry Scheme. So if you are an Indigenous student, um, there will be a significant advantage for applicants, um, whereby if you do get accepted into the course, um, certain costs may be waived um, in regards to your study program. So again, um, always check your spam mail because our faculty will be in contact with you via email sometime in October. We do have C's as well. So C's is basically an adjustment to your ATAR in recognition of circumstances that may have affected your education. So if you feel that there are certain circumstances that may have impacted um, the way you have performed, during your year 12 studies, you can put in a CIS application while um, you are putting in your preferencing on VTAC. So these are some of the categories that are included as part of CIS. So it's not limited to these, but you could put in multiple uh, categories as well. So have a look on our website uh, to see which you may be eligible for. So very briefly, I'll just talk about the grad entry medicine pathway. So it's a four-year degree, like what I've mentioned. So if you are considering medicine, but you aren't too sure about that option yet, you could consider the graduate degree pathway. So if you are interested in this option, we only take in students from within Monash. So you would have need to have done biomedical science, science, physiotherapy, or pharmacy. And once you've completed that, um, if you're shortlisted for the program will call you for an interview. So just a reminder that the GAM set is not required for our post-grad study option, but you could always do it as a backup option if you are looking at applying at applying for other universities within Australia. So within the graduate entry program, we also have the end-to-end -end rural cohort whereby most of our students would be doing their placements regionally within Victoria. Okay, so um, further information can be found on our website. So always refer to our website for information. We do update it very often in regards to key dates as well as 
important um, things that you need to take note of as part of your application for medicine at Bordesh. So feel free to ask um, any further questions that you may have via the Q&A function and we will answer them along the way throughout the evening. But for now, I'd like to pass the time on to Chia Wen, who's a current medical student at Monash. She'll be talking more about her placements and subsequently our other students, Connor, J Jen and Caitlin will jump in as well. All right, Chia Wen, on to you. If you could just switch on your camera and unmute yourself. Hey, Chia Wen. Yes. All right, there you go. Hello, I'm Chao Wen. I'm a final year medical student um, studying medicine at Monash University. So I'm just here to talk a bit about um, placements. So as you all know, first and second year of the course are all um, preclinical and you just usually do 12 week semesters on campus at Clayton. And then years three to five are all clinical placements and they have 18 week semesters or well, you start a bit early. So usually end of Jan, start of February, and then you have a three week mid year break. And then um, you have another 18 week semester and you end at around the same time as everyone else at uni. Um, so in year three, you usually get hospital placements and depending on which site you get placed into, you do different rotations and everyone will be placed at different sites and do different rotations. So for example, I got placed at Dandenong Hospital and I had um, rotations in emergency department, surgery, general medicine, it's all really different. Um, and something exciting to look forward to is um, Monash Medical um, Center Year 3B students will be able to go to the new Heart Hospital, which opened up this year. Um, and you can also um, place preference to go to rural sites as well. Um, and then in fourth year, we have four main rotations, which is your women's health, your psych, your GP, and your children's health rotations. So most of these ones are a bit of a mix between hospitals and clinics. Um, and it just depends on the roster and the timetable that you get as to where you'll be placed. For GP, um, though it's pretty set. So you usually get two days of teaching, um, which I believe now is at the Alfred, which includes lectures and, and stuff like that. And then two days of full placement at a GP clinic with a GP supervising you. And then you get one day off. For placements, um, normally when you first start and it's your first year in placements, we usually just shadow a, like a reg, an intern, anyone really. And um, this is a really great opportunity to watch how they work, how they take histories, how they do exams. And you can ask them questions as they're doing everything um, when it's appropriate. And also it's a really good opportunity for you to see how the hospital works and how it flows and how um, every, everything works basically. Um, and then when you get more comfortable with doing that, you can always start by helping out with the jobs they have as well. And um, when you're in placement, you get to see a lot of procedures like putting in drips or cavities or um, suturing and things like that. And then um, at the start, you might not feel comfortable doing yourself. So it's really good to watch them do it first and um, they can go through everything. And then the next time when the opportunity comes, you can always ask them to supervise you doing it. So you get a lot of hands-on skills as well. Um, and because of that, I really enjoyed the clinical aspect of the degree a lot more because um, like you get to do so many more hands-on things and the information you learn is a lot more relatable because you have to learn about conditions from patients and it's a lot easier to relate when you've actually seen the patient with the condition and taken the history and done the exam. Um, so I really like that more. So I'll just pass on to Connor now who will speak for the next part. Thanks, Sharon. On to you, Connor. Oh, can't hear you, Connor. Could you hear me now? Yes, perfect. No worries. Sorry, I don't think my headphones are working very well, but uh, I'll reintroduce myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Connor. I'm one of the final year medical students in the Monash Doctor of Medicine program. Uh, so this evening, I was hoping to give you some insight into what learning throughout medicine looks like, um, including the different mediums and environments in which it takes place. 
Uh, this will rehash some of the content already covered. Um, but to start, like anything in life, before advancing your learning, you have to gain some foundational knowledge. And uh, medicine is not distinct from this. Uh, it's generally done in the period of the course already covered, known as your preclinical uh, pre years, wherein you delve into the core sciences such as anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, as well as beginning to develop some essential clinical skills, which will require in the latter part of your degree, uh, as well as the remainder of your career. Uh, this includes things like history taking and physical examination. Um, a variety of teaching modes are utilised, so you have things like didactic lectures from clinicians and other Monash staff, prescribed readings, small group tutorials, laboratory sessions and simulated environments. Um, and this period, whilst tough at times, is extremely rewarding and sees you do things that people outside of the medical field will never experience, one of which might be honing your anatomy skills by working with cadavers, which are essentially human corpses used explicitly for scientific learning. Uh, following those preclinical years, your focus shifts more towards clinical learning, which builds on the knowledge you have, but instead mainly takes place within the confines of the hospital. So you have a combination of ward-based learning and also curriculum-based learning. Uh, this is a period of time where you truly begin to develop as a future doctor, as you get to interact with patients with medical conditions, ranging from very simple to extremely complex. And these interactions themselves are an invaluable learning opportunity as you often find yourself discussing with the team's key knowledge associated with those conditions, such as management, uh, diagnosis, and other things. In addition to this, the health service you are placed at will often arrange teaching through something known as a bedside tutorial, uh, where you and a group of medical students are then paired with a senior clinician who will accompany, uh, accompany you to the bedside of a real hospital patient and observe you practicing various clinical skills after which time they'll provide some constructive feedback on what you did well, as well as some areas for improvement. Um, I found these sessions of particular benefit as you had the full undivided attention of a doctor who can use their knowledge and experience to guide you towards becoming a more competent clinician in ways textbooks or other resources cannot. Uh, these are then supplemented with lectures run by the health service on various conditions and relevant topics, along with other resources provided by the university and a healthy dose of uh, self-directed learning. Um, I might use the remaining time uh, to talk about my personal learning experiences in the hospital wards and uh, what that looks like on a regular day. Um, I'm a firm believer that there is no one person that you, can, uh, that you cannot learn from. So you can learn from the most senior uh, consultant doctor or a nurse or the ward clerk. And I think uh, my current rotation in the intensive care unit is the perfect example of this. So uh, just yesterday, after rounding on the patients in the unit in the morning, I spent some time with the junior doctors uh, learning about echocardiography, which is essentially an ultrasound of the heart. And they taught me about the different views and how to interpret them. Um, after doing some ward jobs a bit later, I was then asked by the consultant if I wanted to assist him with putting in an intercostal catheter, uh, which is a chest drain, uh, which you use for patients who have fluid in the space around their lung, where their lung tissue should normally be. Um, after this, I got to watch a lumbar puncture on a separate patient where they insert a needle through the back um, into the space around your spinal cord to collect a fluid sample. Um, later on, then some of the senior nurses ran me through the processes involved in extubating a patient, which is when you take a patient off a ventilator because they may no longer require uh, to help them breathe. Um, however, you can't just turn the machine off, so there are several steps you need to take to achieve this safely. And then amongst all of this, there were multiple times throughout the day I would liaise with the ward clerk to seek guidance regarding administrative tasks and also talking to the pharmacist about medications and indications for those. Um, so as you can see from this small snapshot, there are a lot of different interactions which take place across the day and lots of people who will shape your medical learning. Um, so I hope this has been a little bit of a helpful insight for you guys and uh, gives you a bit of an idea of the structure and day-to-day -day education of a medical student. And um, I hope to see some of you on the wards as a future medical student at Monash. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Um, I'll pass it on to Jen right now. We'll talk a bit about her cohort experience as well as student support at Monash. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student at Monash. Uh, and as she mentioned, I'm just going to have a little bit of a chat firstly about the cohort experience. 
So some of this has already been mentioned, but I thought I'd kind of just lay it out because when I was a student, I was very confused. So the first two years are on campus. Um, so this is known as preclin or the preclinical years. Um, this teaching, there's a mixture now, thanks to COVID, of online and in-person teaching, um, which is all very interactive and case-based. You also get some clinical experiences in these first two years as well. So GP days, there's rural weeks in second year. Um, and in your pre-clean years, you get a lot of different social experiences. So there's an O week or orientation week where there's lots of introductory events where you get to know uh, the other members of your cohort. Um, and then there's continuous social events throughout um, first year and second year. And you do become very close with your cohort. Uh, and even now, I would say that most of my best friends are the people who I've met in first year medicine. So you definitely do make lots of friends. Then onto your clinical years. So as have been mentioned, you have your third year, which is your medicine and surgery year. So I was placed at Frankston Hospital, which was incredible. And as sort of echoing all the other students, it's really exciting to be able to get involved in hospital life. And then in fourth year, you do your GP, your women's psychiatry and children's rotations, and you move around hospitals for each of those. And then your final year of placement. Um, you can also choose to go rural or you may be allocated, allocated as ERC, so extended rural cohort, where you will um, do your placement rurally. Uh, some of my close friends have done all of their placements rurally and they absolutely love it. And you get lots of extra experiences, um, such as experiencing rural life alongside your placements. Uh, and then in your clinical years, you also get lots more leadership opportunities. So there's mentoring programs uh, and other social experiences which continue throughout the entirety of your time at Monash. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the other sort of social or alongside academic activities. So you can be members of, there's a whole lot of clubs um, and committees that you can become involved in. So for example, I've been involved in Ignite, which is a global health club, but depending on what you're interested in, whether you like sport, music, whether you're interested in pediatrics or psychiatry, there's a committee for you. So get excited for all of that. Um, and now I'm just gonna move on to the learning and teaching facilities. Next slide. Um, so as mentioned in preclean, you're at Monash Clayton campus and there's some pretty amazing buildings. Um, so if any of you have ever been on campus, you would have seen the LTB, so the learning and teaching building um, or the medical complex or the biomedical buildings where we do our dissections. Um, and then this is all supplemented by online teaching and resources that you can go and look back on in your own time to supplement your learning. And then when you move on into the clinical years, you get, um, you're, you're placed at a specific hospital and then there's facilities at those hospitals for the students. So there's student hubs, there's social and dining facilities, as well as clinical skill teaching areas. Um, so all of the hospitals that I've been placed at have had incredible facilities. Uh, and then just to finish off, I just wanted to discuss support um, in the course. So I've put up there an image of the available student support. So I won't read through them all as I'm sure everyone can read, but um, there's a whole range of different people who are there to support you during your time at Monash. Um, no matter what you're going through or if you're experiencing any challenge, there's someone there who has a role that wants to help you out. So whether this be um, through Monash as a wider university service, through faculty, um, but also there are peer mentoring programs and student support programs, as well as student teaching programs, which are very helpful. Um, so there is a whole range of people out there who want to support you. Um, and it is a very supportive environment as a cohort as well. So thanks for all of that and good luck everyone. Thanks, Jen. Caitlin, perhaps you could jump on. Thank you. No worries.
Um, hi everyone, my name is Caitlin and I'm an intern or a junior doctor now at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, very excited to be speaking today. So I graduated from Monash as an undergraduate student last year. So today I'm just going to be talking about how my degree and my course has sort of prepared me for my job today, um, but also some of my reflections on my medical school journey. So what I wanted to start out with is I'm sure many of you are students listening to this webinar. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about myself, if that's okay. So I thoroughly enjoy dancing. I love cooking. Um, I still get to hang out with my friends and I also love going to work every single day. And all of these things I kept up in medical school. So it's definitely possible and it's something that I would highly encourage. So when I talk about the medical school journey and I talk about placement, what I think I really got out of it was some incredible memories, which I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Um, obviously a lot of knowledge and theory, which I use in my job every single day. Um, but really it was a lot of personal growth. I think going to placement, being surrounded by your peers and learning from you know, people from all different fields has enabled me to really fill my mind, you know, be curious about different things. So I really wanted to start from the beginning. So I've just finished my rotation in um, the emergency department as a doctor. And my very first placement in medical school was actually the emergency department in a similar hospital. And just reflecting upon my journey from then to now has been a really eye-opening experience and a nice thing to sort of smile back on. It's nice to sort of be reflective on that journey because it was challenging, it was tough, but it's amazing to see how much you can grow and how much you can sort of achieve in that, like, you know, in that time frame. So starting off in third year, my first day on placement, I was very nervous, didn't even know what to say to a patient, let alone how to say different things. Things. Um, moving on to final year, where I was able to go on a rural rotation in Bairnsdale um, for my emergency rotation, I was really able to help the team um, learn and treat different socioeconomic and cultural groups and really sort of grow as a person there. And finally, now where I actually get to work as a doctor in the emergency department, seeing patients independently and learning some of the best of writers. So hopefully you can see that, you know, for myself personally, it wasn't that long ago that I was in high school. I really fondly remember my time in high school and also all of my medical school. Um, I really didn't imagine that I'd be sitting here today talk to you, talking to you now today as an intern, but that's the way it is. Time really flies and you really learn a lot in that time frame. So I was also asked to talk about why placement is so beneficial. And I think what I really want to emphasize is placement is what you get out of it. So what I would encourage you to do is look at medical school and placements as an opportunity to not only further your learning, but also, you know, further your development as a person by taking the time to invest in yourself, you know, learning from others, not only theory, but also the skills to being, you know, a good doctor, a good person, it will ultimately help you sort of develop and therefore you can give back to your community and your patients in the future. So in order to do that, it means not only, you know, thinking about how to get into medical school, but also what you can be doing now for yourself, whether that's, you know, pursuing your hobbies, taking up leadership positions, stepping outside of your comfort zone, doing all of those little things will really prepare you um, in high school, if that's the stage you're at, or applying for medical school. And then once you're in the course, you know, making the most of seizing those opportunities to make the most of each moment. So thank you so much again. I'll pass you on for the rest of the talk. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, if I could get all the students to just quickly switch on their cameras and mics, uh, we will take a couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, all right, so one of the questions that came through was in regards to um, the course mapping from year one to year five. So at which point is it that students would go on to full-time placements? Perhaps, Julia, if you could take that. Julia, are you there? Oh yeah, hi. Sorry, I was um, <laughs> no worries. typing into the Q and A, getting the question. Yeah, so um, it, it was in regards to it. So, at which point of the five year degree will students be embedded full time into hospitals or clinics? Oh, okay. So, if it's in the five year program, it'll be the third year. So, the first two years are on campus. And the third, fourth, and fifth year, uh, almost fully at the hospitals. I'd All say right. Ninety-eight percent of it is based in the hospitals. Yep. Um. There was also another question in regards to the first two years. What are the class hours like? 
Uh, it's a full-time course. Um, lots of students have part-time jobs. Um, and some of the course content uh, involves watching um, recorded lectures. Um, so, that, so there's a, a few aspects of the course that you can do at a time that suits you. Um, and that creates some breaks during the weekdays. Um, but I, it's not like other courses where students can find, you know, one or two whole days where they're free to do part-time work. Um, uh, you know, it, you, you might get an afternoon um, a week or something like that. I can see Jen's nodding, so I'm on the right <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm yes, um, I, I do have a question that maybe Jen could help answer as well. It's in regards to hours. So we do have another question in regards to so what times are lectures and lessons usually held? Are they usually held in between 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Or could you expect any later classes? Yeah, so um, firstly, in terms of the work thing, you definitely can um, have a part-time job if you're organised. But as Julia mentioned, it is a full-time course. So um, you can't be expecting to work every day. But for example... Um, in pre-clean I worked on the weekends so if you can find a job that mm -hmm. takes that into consideration that's a great option um, in terms of the timing of the classes they normally began uh, yeah nothing was earlier in pre-clean than eight and everything wrapped up normally by about six six thirty uh, and then when you're on placement at the hospital it depends on the team that you're shadowing so for example, sometimes you might be with a surgical team, so you might have to get there a little bit earlier, say at 7 a.m. Um, and then, for example, on your women's placement, you might have to do the odd night shift, um, but they're very exciting. So it's all something to look forward to. Thanks, Jen. All right, uh, we do have another question. Um, maybe Julia and Caitlin, you could touch on this as well, if you are aware of any of your friends who have gone through this pathway. Are there any opportunities um, for students to take non-medicine or, sorry, are there any opportunities for students who do not go into medicine once they actually graduate? So meaning they go on to other areas of work and not actually become a doctor. Um, yeah, though I did answer a question like this mm. in the chat. So yeah, another one came true. <laughs> yeah, there's just a handful. So um, I would say 99% of our graduates go on to do an internship. Um, so after internship, then um, they're fully registered as um, medical practitioners in Australia. Um, there would be maybe one or two um, that end up doing different things, um, or it may, we don't track all our students. So it may be that, that, you know, they're taking a year off before internship, but usually it's good to do it straight away while you've got the momentum. And um, some people go into areas like public health um, uh, or occasionally into, you know, consultancy firms. Um, so to have got through a medical degree, um, it, it demonstrates that you've got certain skills um, and, it, you know, it's generally a challenging degree. Um, so it's still a good qualification um, uh, for a lot of um, jobs where you don't necessarily have to have had done vocational training. But I would say that most medicine courses in Australia, all medicine courses in Australia, are set up as vocational courses. So that means that they're really setting you up to work as junior doctors in hospitals um, as soon as you graduate. So it's very geared um, towards um, a specific job, as opposed to like arts or science, um, where you can go in lots of different directions. All right. Thanks, Julia. Um, Caitlin, this is a question that's probably more suited for you. So when uh, when applying for an internship year after your degree, did you need to undertake a normal sort of like interview CV type of uh, cover letter process for finding an internship position? Yeah, no, great question. So very similar to VTAC for high school students in Victoria, we have something called PMCV, which is a very similar process. 
So around in the middle of your final year, you um, have a resume, you also do a cover letter to multiple different hospitals, then there's sort of this centralized interview process, which might change in future years. But for myself, we had a centralized interview online, which got sent out to all the different health services. And then each health service um, sort of had different requirements. So some required like an academic transcript, others required a non-clinical uh, referee. And um, that's another thing you have. You ask for references in your final year as well. So they can sort of, you know, attest to your skills. So that's sort of the requirements for getting an internship in Victoria. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, we've got a question. Probably, Julia, you could answer this or any of the students as well. So in regards to the first two years of um, the med degree, is there any possibility at all for students to do non-related medical subjects? Um, we have an occasional student who does medicine and law, um, but uh, I think that the short answer is no. Um, it's not built into the course in any way. I know some other courses, um, all students have to do something from a different discipline. So I yes. think the short answer is no, but there might be a few exceptions. Yeah, so with the med degree, it is pretty structured. So all subjects are essentially core units. So there aren't um, elective subjects that you could choose to do outside of your study area. Okay, um, so we've got another question in regards to... Um, all right, perhaps um, if the students, one of you, could just share um, your top tip in regards to preparing for the MMI. Perhaps Chowen, if you could share, followed by Connor. Yeah, so um, I definitely think it's useful to prepare for the M MMI. So um, like classic situations that they would ask or like ethics kinds of things. So they won't ask any clinical information because they don't expect that of you. But just to practice being comfortable and because it's online now, being comfortable in front of the camera and then practicing with like friends or even your family members um, so that you can speak without stuttering and look confident um, and then some of the key topic areas would be really helpful as well. Um, and I think another thing is um, during your MMIs, um, it's your opportunity to also include any extracurricular activity that you've done in it. Um, so just to practice examples with those as well. Yeah, very well said, Chawan. So you could, you know, use this opportunity to record yourself, given that it's um, going to be held online. You could record yourself, watch yourself and sort of um, give um, like critics as well to see you know how you can further improve your posture or even the way you speak so yes that, those are really great tips Chowen. Um, Connor have you got anything to add in regards to preparing for the MMI? Not too much to add um, the only thing I would uh, say is to really have a think of some personal examples um, and have those to back up any statements you make so uh, a lot of questions might be ethics based or scenario based um, however there will also be times you're asked about uh, challenges in your own life or things that you've encountered and so to have a think about moments like that and uh, think about what you'd want to say and what you want to uh, tell the uh, examiner who's listening to your answer um, and what you want to actually convey that's uh, my tip. All right, thanks, Connor. Um, sorry, Julia, I see that you've got your hand up as well. Um, so I did notice a question in the Q&A um, asking about, is it important to have work experience or volunteer experience? While uh, our med degree is not a job, uh, we do not require that form of, or that level of work experience, but like what um, Chowen and Connor has mentioned, um, any form of experience would really help give real life examples as part of the interview so yes they could potentially be helpful when um, giving examples during the MMI all right Julia sorry I just wanted to give my tip for MMI mm -hmm. preparation and there's probably some um, parents in the room too so my tip would be um, dinner table conversation um, so discuss issues things that crop up in the paper or um, in society because um, uh, I think being, being able to see different perspectives and viewpoints, um, different ways of looking at things um, is very helpful. And, and just having um, a bit more general knowledge about things going on in society um, can be helpful too. 
All right, thanks, Julia. So we are slightly past 6 p.m., but we will take two more questions, if that's all right, um, before we wrap up. So one of the final questions we have is in regards to um, offshore placement opportunities. Julia, have you got any insights on, you know, any overseas opportunities for our medical students as part of the degree? Uh, yes, so um, the, in final year, we have um, some exchanges that we do with some of our international um, partner universities. So um, there's, um, we've got a partner university in Singapore, London, Germany, um, Denmark, Japan. Uh, so these are set up. We, we take students from, that, from their medical schools as well. Um, I know that there are extracurricular opportunities um, in the earlier years. Uh, there's a lot of students in the course, so um, the trips are a bit competitive. Um, but just in general at Monash, um, since last year, there's been a big push to give Monash students uh, experiences of international travel. And actually, the um, lately, any time I've met a Monash student, whether it's at my local bakery or um, uh, relatives, um, they've all got these trips planned with um, Monash Uni. So my niece is heading off to Japan um, in June this year, going with a group of 20 other students from Monash. So it's a big part of Monash um, uh, and that, that's, that's growing. But at the moment, probably there's not opportunities for every student, but for interested students, um, there are some. Thanks, Julia. All right, um, the last question, perhaps um, both Jennifer and Caitlin could touch on this. So are clinical years taught by Monash professors or by the doctors at the hospitals that you are placed at? Um, Jen, do you want to answer first? Sure. Um, so it depends a little bit. So for example, I just finished my um, psychiatry rotation at the Alfred. Um, and a lot of your teaching is on the wards. So by the doctors that you go in for ward rounds with every day, they'll often take time out of their day to sit down and give you a mini tutorial or answer any questions that you've got. Uh, and then you also have some scheduled classes, um, which are often from Monash professors or doctors from that um, clinical site that you're placed at. Thanks, Jennifer. Caitlin, have you got anything to add on to that? Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. As Jennifer said, I would add that, as I said in my sort of speech, it's really you you take what you get, so that what you give sort of situation. So if you don't sort of ask for learning to, you know, you, there might be heaps of learning opportunities. I think Connor spoke about this in his presentation as well. You know, you really have to seek that knowledge, you know, ask for help as well. Um, I myself teach a lot of my medical students on the ward as well. So people at all levels from all different um, jobs and part of the healthcare sort of area in, in which your place will be really willing to teach you as long as you seize those opportunities. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Okay, um, one last question um, before we wrap up for today. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, just give me a moment. Okay, um, so this is more of a general tip uh, for those who are preparing for VCE uh, this year. What are some, you know, top study tips that, you know, you could provide for students that are stressing out and worrying about um, getting a good ATAR score this year? Perhaps, yeah, each of you could give a tip and we would wrap up. Um, Chao, do you want to go first? Um, I would say try to prepare well in advance and not try to do everything and cram last minute before your SACs or your exams because that like takes a lot of stress off if you start preparing in advance. Yeah. Um, Connor, one top tip. Yep. Uh, explicitly for BCE, I would uh, consider starting uh, practice exams early, uh, becoming familiar with the content that's commonly tested, um, and then you can uh, have that in mind throughout the year as you go about your studies and sort of target uh, areas of weakness that way. Um, Jennifer. Um, I've responded to this a few times, but there's been a couple of questions about choosing subjects. Um, and I would definitely say choose subjects that you enjoy because you'll spend a lot more time studying for them um, than subjects that, for example, scale up. So in year 12, I actually did art, for example. Um, and because I loved it so much, you know, I spent more time 
um, putting in the effort for that subject. So do subjects that you enjoy and that you think that you will like studying because the more time that you put in, um, the more of a better outcome you might get. So yeah, do things you enjoy, not just because they scale up. Thanks, Jennifer. And Caitlin, um, one top tip to yeah. wrap the session up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was an IB student. So hello to all my fellow IB people out there. Um, my tip is to find a really supportive study group, um, people that will genuinely support you for your progress. Um, and another thing to remember is that your biggest competitor is yourself. So hopefully treat yourself a little bit of kindness, you know, practice some mindf mindfulness and gratitude that will really help um, and put your hand up when you need it. Don't be too harsh on yourself. Enjoy the whole journey of high school. It's, it's a really fun one. All right. Thanks, Kaylin. Sorry. Um, one more important point that I forgot to raise uh, was in regards to top tips for the UCAT, which is, you know, a massive test that a lot of students fear. <laughs> um, perhaps, uh, Jennifer, if you do not mind, if you could just share a couple of um, preparation tips um, that you have undertaken yourself for the UCAT. Yeah, sure. So I did the UCAT the first year that it came out. And I remember when it came out, I was so stressed because I'd actually already started studying for the UMAT. Um, but my biggest tip would be it's 30%, so 33, sorry, it's a third of your um, entry requirement. So think about how much time you're putting in to study for year 12. So the more time that you can put in to even just reading through questions, becoming familiar with the format of the UCAT is so beneficial so that you get in there on the day and you're not overwhelmed by something that's completely new. So my top tip would be get started early. Um, and even just if every night you do a couple of questions from each section, I think that would put you in great stead. And good luck, everyone. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, that pretty much covers um, the top tips for the for VCE, um, for the MMI as well, as well as the UCAT. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we will stay back, a couple of us will stay back to answer the rest of the questions. But if not, this pretty much concludes the webinar today. So this session is recorded and the recording will be posted on our website about a week from now. So thanks everyone and we look forward to seeing you at Monash either at Open Day or sometime next year. Thank you everyone.